perhaps best known for a collection of short plays under the title All in the Timing. He is a playwright, a translationist, an adaptationist, a writer of musical theater, short fiction, nonfiction. Well, in short, he is a writer's writer. Would you welcome to the Kennedy Center and to the Dramatist Guild, David Ives, ladies and gentlemen. David, you know, the glory of the internet is that we can find out all kinds of glorious, interesting... It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Whatever information it is. About, about people. And I, I read something to you that I want to read to you and then uh, talk about real quick. You said, and I quote, I work at a table I've written on for years in a very small, very dark room in our apartment. I keep the doors closed and the shade down just to keep the right level of writing darkness. Entirely true. I did actually say that, and it is true. Um, in fact, that table has begun to be worn out where I've, where I've been writing in the middle of it, you know, the way stairs get worn out. Um, yes, I, I think because when I was starting out as a playwright, I, I wrote late at night that I think that I can't get away from that now. And so I really, uh, in our last apartment, I actually nailed black styrofoam over the window so that I could, it was like a dark room. And I was the one who was developing. Um, and uh, so yes, I do, I do actually need a small, uh, small dark room. And I can't help it. I can't write in, in bright light. I can't write in hotel rooms. I, it's, just, it's just the way I am. And the table, did the, was the table just a table at one point and then it became your writing table? Well, or? Uh, no, I bought, it, I bought it as a writing table, but it's, it's this massive oak thing. That if I wanted to, I could fold it out for 12 people, but my room wouldn't, wouldn't take them. Right. So uh, yes, that's, that's how I work. I was also intrigued to read that a fairly prestigious um, uh, magazine labeled you one of the 100 smartest people in New York City. Um, it's a lie. It's a total <laughs> lie. Um, and, oh, well. oh, uh, <laughs> hello. Sorry. Can we What's do that again? What's in that cup? <laughs> <laughs> hello. Right, well, right, here we right. are. And, As I was saying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me I don't just know. I, uh, <laughs> Let me just add to that. I mean, I, I mean, part of that, David, I, I have to say is. Anybody that I know that has ever spoken of you and myself, folks always refer to this outrageous intellect of yours. And so, is that is that a way to run it's your not, neck? It, it, uh, is that a way to run my neck, or, or is that my mother? No, that's yes. Um, I uh, I was I was in this article for the hundred smartest New Yorkers, and um, the thing is, it's a total hoax because I'm a playwright, and as a playwright. I don't have to know anything. You know, it's like truly smart people have to, have to know physics and mathematics, and, and all I have to know is how to write a second act, which is nothing. But, you know, a playwright just makes up the rules as he or she goes along. And so I don't, I, I always thought it was so funny because what I, what I actually am is I'm like a, I'm like a clown in a parade who's like throwing up the same ball and everybody goes, oh, he, he, he took away the other five balls he's supposed to be juggling, you know? And so it's just like I created my own rules and somehow people thought that was smart. But no, I, I, I always thought that was, because truly smart people do know something about something and I don't really know anything about anything. So I'm, <laughs> except playwriting. Um, but no, it's, it, it, it was odd. Right. It was very odd. Well, I'll tell you something that you, you apparently seem to know and, and that there's a whole generation of writers that want to say a collective thank you to about was All in the Timing oh, thank and, you. and the short play. Um, I, I think something that often comes up in conversation when somebody says, well, what do you do with a 10-minute play or what do you do with a one-act play? Somebody will say, well, David Ives had. Look at <laughs> David Ives. So was, I'm, I'm just curious about the evolution of that. Was it, was it what was it? What was it? It was happenstance, partly. Mm -hmm. um, I had never, I hadn't been writing one act plays at all. I was, uh, I was writing long, deeply serious, pretentious plays instead. And I think that when I was, when I was a young playwright, I had this idea that 
to be great, you had to be serious. And so I, was, I spent a lot of years trying to be Edward Albee and Strindberg and those people. And um, at some point, and I think it was right after I got my first job in the movies, uh, writing a script for a movie that never got done, I, um, I made a little bit of money and maybe for the first time in my life I just relaxed a little bit. And I had this idea um, for a little play about the three monkeys. You know, if you put three monkeys in a room and they type, you'll get Hamlet. Well, that's, I, I just wondered what they talked about while they were typing and um, what sort of typewriters they had. And they probably were typing in a little dark room with, the, with styrofoam nailed over the, over the windows. But I just wondered what they said to each other while they were typing Hamlet. And so... I wrote that play, and at the time, there was a place called the Manhattan Punchline, which uh, did a one-act festival, right around the same, which began right around the same time. And so I gave it to Steve Kaplan, who ran it, and he wanted to do it. And so uh, every year after that, I had a I had a little one-act play for him that went into the festival, and soon I had accumulated a bunch of plays, and. Uh, the director of some of those plays thought that they would make an evening and uh, called All in the Timing, which he named and not, not I. And uh, so he went around to every producer and artistic director in New York with this idea and they all turned him down. And because they said nobody would want an evening of one act plays. And finally he went to Casey Childs of Primary Stages and Casey said that the mission of Primary Stages was to do only new work. And so he couldn't do these plays because they'd been produced before. So he said, if you'll write one more play for this batch, then I'll do it. And so I wrote Universal Language, and it was done as all in the timing. And um, I don't know, it was all kind of happenstance. Everything about my writing life is happenstance. And Were you surprised by its success? <clears throat> because um, it was wildly successful. It was, it was, if I do say so myself, uh, quite successful. And when the first preview happened, we actually knew we had a hit from the first preview. I must say that the first audience told us that, this, that they just they loved it in ways that we never expected to. But up until that point, no, we didn't know. We were just another show, and we were just putting it up and uh, doing the best we could. And uh, so, no, we, we, we didn't know until then. And <clears throat> I think the producer, I think Casey Childs, was amazed, and everybody was. And um, I knew that we had something on our hands when my wife came back from the washroom, from the ladies' room, and she said, all the women in the women's room are speaking Unamunda. And so, you know, there's that play in there in which they speak this gibberish language called Unamunda. And she said, all the women in the women's room are going Velcro, Harvard U. And so... Uh, at that point, when, pe when women are speaking your play in the women's room, you know that there's something going on. And uh, that's been an ideal of my life, for my entire life. I want women reciting my plays in the ladies' room. Um, and so, uh, yes, and it was, it was fun, but partly because they'd been, I'd written them all before, you didn't have that entirely new feeling, um, but it was fun. And so was there that temptation, David, then to just continue along that track, or I did that, that was done, now I'm gonna go on to something else? Well, I, I had a second show called Mere Mortals, which also ran off-Broadway for a time, which was a collection of six more one acts, and um, at a certain point, I, I sort of leveled off writing one act plays a little bit, partly because the Manhattan Punchline closed down. Um, in fact, largely because, and also because I, I lost my relationship with the director who had directed a lot of them, which was also very valuable. Because you see, it was not only important to me to have a place to do these plays, but in the course of writing these plays, I was introduced to a director named Jason Buses, who directed All in the Timing. And... Um, I have to say that I, I had found the perfect director for my work, and, and the way I met him was quite interesting because he was, uh, I, I wrote this play called Sure Thing for um, 
the Manhattan Punchline Festival, which was quite successful. But the, the reason it was successful, really, was the director and finding this director. Because I gave that play to Steve Kaplan, who ran the Punchline, and he said to me, this is a very, very special play, and I know exactly the director to direct this. And so he said, I'll set up a meeting. And um, I went to meet this person, Jason Buses, and um, he came up to meet me and he said, I've read your play, I like your play very much, but you go wrong on page 12, let me show you where. And he opened the play and he said, right at this line, you go, you go wrong. And he was absolutely right. And when he said it, I knew that he was right. And there was none of the nonsense of, I adore your play, blah, blah, blah. You know, there was, it was, I like your play, but let's go to work. And when he said, you go wrong at this point, I realized that he had truly understood the play. And so we just went straight to work. And it was because Jason was such a brilliant director that I could write things like Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread, which is a, 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 a play spoken in rhythm, or variations on the death of Trotsky. <coughs> Or, um, <coughs> excuse me, foreplay, which is a play which is a fugue for six actors, you know, which is three couples uh, going in, uh, in a pattern, three, three couples who are sort of the same man in three different stages of his life. And it's all done in fugue form. And he, just because I had a director who could do that, I was, I was so freed because I didn't have to worry about how to put it up. I didn't have to worry about... Was there someone who would know how to put this up? And so um, for several years, I had both a home and I had a director who knew how to do my plays instantly. And I had actors, I had accumulated these actors along the way who simply knew how to, how to do these plays. When I wrote Universal Language, this play that's written in this gibberish language called Unamunda, um, the two people who had been in Sure Thing had become friends of mine, and so I was, I was, I was meeting them in a bar, and I was carrying this play, and I asked them if they would read the play. And so at the bar, that was the first reading of the play, was at at Walker's down in, in Soho, and we just opened it up, and they instantly knew how to read this gibberish language. And so when you have that kind of actor, the possibilities for what you can write are so extraordinary. It's like having your own company, your own repertory company, whom you don't have to instruct, you don't have to, you don't have to direct. They just see it and they know. And so I think that um, when the punchline closed and I didn't have that home, and then uh, Jason and I um, had some artistic differences about, about uh, a play that we were working on. And so we kind of we didn't have the same working relationship, and so I'd lost my home, and then I lost my director, and so I, I then wrote a couple of one-act plays that somebody else directed, and he was a very good director, but it wasn't the same. And so I think that it was like I had a symphony orchestra on my hands that just knew how to do it, or a chamber, a chamber group, and having lost them, I think I lost my interest in exploring it because it's very rare that you find that kind of collaboration. And, um, you know, although people say that, that a playwright is, that we live in a playwright's theater, I actually think we live in a director's theater, partly because there are very few really perfect directors around. You know, there's a handful of brilliant directors. And among those brilliant directors, there are a few who, they, they, you know, there are things that each of them does brilliantly. It's like Daniel Sullivan does drama brilliantly, and Joe Mantello does kind of um, language plays beautifully. And so, but you need to be put with the right director. And because critics are so ignorant these days, critics go to see plays now. And critics don't know the difference between the production and the play. And so I find it so interesting where a critic will, a critic will mistake for the play what is actually production and vice versa. And they don't, critics don't know what directors do, and so they can't really speak intelligently. And so actually in our theater right now, I feel as if a play's success is really the director's, is really in the, in the hands of the director. 
because I've seen bad plays with brilliant directors that have been very successful and vice versa. And so I feel like I'm in very precarious ground, partly because of the, the, the kind of writer that I am. Because I write, as I've found out over time, I write very difficult plays to do. You know, you really, you need great technique to, to do the plays that I write. And so it's dicey out there for me. And um, I have lately uh, been working with Walter Bobby a lot, um, who's a director who directed Chicago. And he directed my one act play last year at the Ensemble Studio Theater. And so we have a relationship, but it's a very different kind of relationship. He's not the same kind of director as Walter Bobby. And so in a funny way, I'm writing differently, partly because I have a collaboration with someone who gives me something different. And so the playwright-director relationship is so vital, and yet I find that, that you, the, the chances of, of being hooked up with the right director are, are slim. We've talked to a lot of playwrights over the last week here, and it, everybody has their own process for writing. Most people, when you ask them, don't have a, a, a regiment, so to speak, but you actually do, from what I've read. You're somebody who actually gets up and writes every day, takes a break, and comes back and right. writes in the evening. Right. Is that still true? That is still true. It's been true for years and years. I, I, um, if I don't write, I feel desolate. And so, to me, there's no such thing as a day off. I write on Sundays and Saturdays and holidays. There's no such thing as a holiday. And when I go away from home and I can't write, I just, I, I really feel deprived. It's like being uh, away from my wife or something. But um, I find that sitting down every day, just getting into that habit <coughs> is so valuable to it, it has been to me. I mean, when I started out as a writer, <clears throat> and I started writing very young. I, I, was, I wrote my first play when I was nine, you know. But that need to sit down and write crossed over into a habit of writing. And those two, that's a very nice position to be in because when it becomes an addiction, then you, you are driven to do it, even when you're not inspired, but you will, you will simply sit down and do it. Raymond Chandler used to, used to have a rule that he would sit down every day for four hours, whether he was writing or not, but he had to sit at the desk, even if he was doing nothing, but he, just the fact that he was there and set that time aside was important to him. Um, but yes, I do, I do need that, and so I, I have this, this schedule that I don't like to break. It's like um, I, I sit down, I have breakfast, and then I sit down to write. And I, I take five minutes for lunch, and then I sit down again, and I write till 2 or 2.30. I've never been able to write in the afternoon. And then uh, I, I can type in the afternoon, though. So I, you know, if I have something that I need to type up, I'll type up. But then after dinner, if I'm working on, on a project, I might sit back down to it and work from um, 8 till 11 or 8 till midnight. Um, and there was a time last year when I was working on three projects at the same time, and I was actually working on one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening, and I was typing the one in the afternoon. So it's like uh, there was writing in the morning, typing in the afternoon, writing in the evening. And um, it's wonderful. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have, to have that daily routine to sit down and, and work. And even if, if, I don't, if I'm not working on a new project, I will pull something out of the trunk and I will work on that and just play, because it's just so important to, to keep in the habit. Um, I was writing a, a, a young adult novel recently, and I, 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 I was having difficulty with um, figuring it out. But I just decided that I was going to write a thousand words a day. And, I, and, and when I'd finished my thousand words, I didn't have to worry. But, but just setting myself that limit gave me a kind of endpoint that I could keep to, and so that that kind of that kind of thing is very valuable, because the traps of not writing are so many. I mean, the, the temptation not to write, I mean, any any excuse will do, and so you know. Um, but sitting down and and I don't let I don't let the clock chime ten o'clock without being at my desk. Mm. So. 
You're one of the few writers that I know that writes across many disciplines, uh, nonfiction, fiction, plays, musicals, translations, adaptations. Was that just by accident, or was that just the way it fell out in the big scheme of things? It's it's complete accident. Um, <coughs> Everything, almost everything about my writing life is accident. Um, in terms of how things have happened, like the way all in the timing happened, was real, had so little to do with me. Um, uh, the way I got my agent was my first agent was was total accident because an agent happened to sit in on a class of mine at Yale and heard an idea that I had for a movie, and she called me up and she said, "I think I can sell that idea," and so, "Would you like to go to Hollywood and pitch it?" And I said, "Sure." So. Um, I, I didn't plan it. So when people ask me about how things happen, I, I don't really know. It's like, how do you get a production? I don't know. They just kind of happen. But the same has been true of the kind of diversity of things that I do. But I, I do know one thing about my writing life, which is that I have found it a mistake ever to accept a project that I didn't want to do. And I found that out in the in the worst possible way because I don't I don't know if you're aware of this, but I I worked on a show called Dance of the Vampires a few years ago on Broadway, which is a, a kind of colossal famous flop on Broadway, and um, fourteen million dollars straight down the toilet, and um, I had had this rule about not working on a project that I that I shouldn't be working on, and I was friends with Jim Steinman, the composer of this of this musical rock and roll composer. <coughs> and he took me to Germany. It was a big hit in Germany. And he took me to Germany. And we were working on Batman the musical at the time. And um, he took me to Germany to the, to the Wagner Festival. And he said, would you like to go to Stuttgart and see my musical, Dance of the Vampires? And I said, sure. So we went to Stuttgart. This, and we saw this musical directed by Roman Polanski. And I knew and he turned to me at the he turned to me at the at the intermission and he said so what do you think and and i didn't know what to tell him but what i knew was that this was not my taste this musical and then he said to me would you like to work on it and i said no because i knew that it was not it was just not me and then he approached me again a couple of months later and said would you work on it i have american producers who want to bring it to america but they want it changed and i said i just don't think this is my project and he said, do you have any ideas for working on it? And I told him some ideas. And then the producers called me up. And the producers said, we've heard your ideas for working on this musical, and we will pay you X amount of money to work on it. And Jim really wants to work with you. And so for two very bad reasons, friendship and money, I said yes. And it was a terrible mistake, because no matter what, even though Jim was my friend, and even though they were offering me this money to work on this, I had turned it down twice. I knew that this was not for myself. And it ended up that it was a mistake. And it was a terrible way to learn that because, you know, I was, I was sort of betraying my friend by helping him out. But I've never, it certainly strengthened my rule that whatever anybody comes, whenever anybody comes to me with a project, a writing project, I will only accept it if I absolutely know that it's for me. So that's how these things have come about, is someone came to me and said, would you like to translate Yasmina Reza's new play? And so I read the play, and I said yes, because I knew that it was interesting. And um, so I've been, these things have come to me by happenstance, but there is a rule in, in the sense that only things that I really believe are for me, because if it's not for you, it's, it's hack work, no matter how highly paid you are or how interesting the project or anything else. It just, if, if you're not in it, it's just not, not going to work out. It won't be good. Your work on the Spanish play, Yasmina Reza's play, it w is, is it a, how much of a challenge was that for you? Was, was it, who are you being responsible to? That literal translation of that play, your interpretation of her play? Um, I felt uh, it was interesting working on that play because I had just translated a flea in her ear right before that. And, and working in a flea in her ear, I felt very free because Fedot is dead. And so I could, I could take, 
I thought it was my job to help Fado along in a certain sense because there because as as I worked on Fado I, on Fleet or Ear, I realized that there were ways that I could sort of tighten it up and fix it up a little bit. So I kind of my my version of Fleet or Ear is is sort of an adaptation in a certain way. But when I was approached about Yasmina's play, Yasmina is, is well and thriving in Paris, and so I felt this loyalty both to the play and to her because I wanted, I really wanted her to be happy. So I, over there, I had this woman I had only spoken to once on the telephone in broken English and French, and I wanted to make her very happy about what I was doing. On the other hand, I had this play and I felt like I had to, I had to make the play happy at the same time. And so there was this constant shuttling between um, satisfying the playwright and trying to bring this into English. And so it was very hard that way. But ultimately my, my real loyalty in that play was, was to creating this thing and and I it was it was ultimately every day I would ask myself if this play had been written in English what would it sound like you know and I mean being loyal to her but if if she were in an, an, an American writer today and were writing this play what would these people sound like and so it became this that became what I was writing to mm. was those people and what they sound like David, let me ask, is when, what starts your process for you? I mean, I understand you have this daily process of writing, yeah. but is there, is it an idea that intrigues you? Is it a, a character? Is it a person? Is it a, uh, something that happens in the newspaper? Um, comes from all kinds of places, one particular? I don't have any particular place where these things come from, and uh, I wish I knew where they came from in a, in a way, but it has to, for some of the short plays, it was an idea that struck me that day, and I sat down and I wrote it that night. Um, on the other hand, a play like Sure Thing was, was an idea I'd carried around for years. I wrote this idea down in a notebook, I would say seven years before I wrote Sure Thing, where I, in a notebook I wrote two people on stage having every possible conversation that could result from this opening line. And the original line was, um, is this the number five bus? Uh, but that changed. But, um, but I always had this image of two people um, going through all possible permutations of one conversation. And, uh, and, the, pro and I, the problem was I never knew how to stage that. And then one night I, I, I was just so bothered by that idea. I thought, well, that's a great idea. I think I'll sit down. And I sat down and I just, and I, I realized I had two people on stage, so it had to be a love story. And um, I thought bus stop is not very interesting. Cafe table is more romantic. And so I put the woman at the cafe table and had him enter. And of course, what's the first thing you say when you enter a cafe? Is this seat taken? And so that was the beginning of the play. And they got through the conversation and I thought, how do I divide up all the possible permutations? And I thought, well, just for the hell of it, I'll write in a bell, I'll have a bell ring. And then I thought, well, that's kind of funny. And so the bell became permanent, even though it was just a, a sort of, um, you know, device off the top of my head. But so it can go between an idea I've carried around for years to something I read that day. Usually, um, it's something I carry around for a little while that that just bothers me. It's either an idea or a situation, or a person. And uh, my next. For example, the next play that's going up in New York is a play about Spinoza, the, the philosopher Spinoza. And <clears throat> I know exactly where this play began. I read Spinoza years ago at, at Yale when I was at the drama school, and I didn't really understand him, but I was fascinated by him. In any case, recently I read that somebody asked Einstein at the end of his life, do you believe in God? And Einstein said, I believe in Spinoza's God. And I just wondered what that meant. And so I started reading up on Spinoza, and as I was reading, I thought, my God, there's a great play here, because he was expelled from the Jewish community of his time. And 
it seemed to me the more I read about him, the more dramatic it was, and the more he was somebody that I wanted to meet. Because Spinoza was this extraordinary philosopher, and yet everybody who met him loved him. He was the most rational man in the world and apparently the most lovable. And so I thought, what an amazing character that is, this 23-year-old Jewish merchant in Amsterdam in 1656 who is excommunicated from, his, from the Jewish community and who goes off into the world to start a new life and become a philosopher. And it just seemed so dramatic, but he, seemed, he just seemed to be calling out to me. And so I read up about him a lot, and I just felt like he was, I wanted him in the same room with me. And so I wrote this play that supposedly would put him in the room with me. Mm -hmm. And so it was really like wanting to meet somebody mm -hmm. and getting to meet him by creating him. So it was more like, my writing table was more like a Ouija board than a, than a writing table. Would you all join me in thanking David for being with us today?